Mark, I guess we'll get started. Um, I'm Ed, and this is part two of a two-part series on Crete. And in the first part, we went through basic mining history, and I got up to a certain place in the 1960s and said, we're going to stop here because part two is a complete story in, in and of itself. And it starts out by saying that this has absolutely nothing to do whatsoever with Crete. But there was a point in time when we didn't really know about the kind of volcanic activity that went on in the San Juans or specifically at Crete. This is Kilauea from the other day. And this is a, a mere pimple. Um, I, I heard that the parking lot on the top of the mountain fell into the crater, at which point I go, big whoop. And I'll show you why. And this has nothing to do with it either. And this has nothing to do with it, although it is a spectacular photograph with a helicopter for scale. But all of these things are basaltic volcanism. And that is mineralogically, geochemically, completely the opposite at the far end of the scale of what we find going on in the San Juans. And we didn't really know a whole lot about this for a long, long time. We know that Pompeii was destroyed and we talk about Plinian type eruptions and things like this, but uh, geologists pretty much remained in the dark until 1902. And that was when Mount Pele went off on the island of Martinique in the West Indies. That is Mount Pele, and this is where the eruption pretty much destroyed everything, and the town of St. Pierre is there. And this is a view of St. Pierre today because there really weren't any photographs of the town before the eruption. But they pretty much rebuilt everything just in place. And it was around 30,000 inhabitants. And this is a view after the eruption. And 29,998 people were dead. There were two people that survived. One guy was in a dungeon in the jail, and it was down in this basement, literally in the dungeon, and he survived. And there was another guy that was on a boat in the harbor, and the shock wave apparently knocked him into the water, and he turned the boat over on top of himself and managed to weather the events. And the French were in charge of the island at this particular time, and they immediately sent a geologist over who began the inquiry as to what on earth was this that had actually happened, because it wasn't on anybody's radar screen. And throughout the rest of the early part of the 20th century, there were a series of eruptions um, of Mount Pele, and in, and, and in fact, Frank Perret actually was on Puerto Rico at the time of the eruption, eruption, and he went there, and he was completely impressed and in fact becomes a volcanologist because of his observations. And then in the 1920s, um, Mont Pele again erupts in a major eruption, and he shows up and puts together the first real report uh, that any of the Americans had done. There was one, of course, done in French. Um, but that's what was going on. So with that, we moved to Crete in the San Juans, and there's this same picture that I've shown you before. And it is this area that is the San Juan Mountains, and those are all related to the kind of volcanism uh, that we saw in Martinique. This is a geologic map of the Creed area 
and that's the town of Creed right there. And there's a couple of black lines, and it doesn't really matter too much for our purposes. This one is actually the Amethyst Fault. And this is by Whitman Cross and Esperson Larson. They mapped off and on for, I don't know, 20 years up there and did a study on the petrology of the volcanic rocks. And they weren't really trying to look at structure and they weren't really trying to understand the volcanology. They were doing a whole lot of lab work and characterizing the rocks. And you can certainly see that there is this sort of roundish feature here and in the middle it says Snowshoe Mountain. And that is in fact the Creed Caldera. But everything else that is a major volcanic feature is missing from this map. And Whitman Cross and Larson himself too are, are two of the truly great geologists. It was just that this concept wasn't really something that had presented itself front and center to geologists at the time. And this is the guy that really sort of put it all together and figured it out there in the central San Juans. This is Tom Stephen as a young man on horseback, and this is how he actually mapped. Um, he was able to cover a huge amount of ground. And through time, he put together the story, and the more that he put together, the more the survey got involved in the whole thing, the more manpower they uh, threw at it, the more money they threw at it, and the whole project ends up in the um, 1980s with um, uh, Paul Barton and Phil Bethke and a number of other people putting together a study of the, of the Creed Mining District and they studied it so much that Phil Bethke used to joke and say, um, well we, we called it a type of mineral deposit but we've studied it to death and actually it's a type with more exceptions than any type you've ever seen in your entire life. But it was a labor of love. Phil's not with us anymore. Paul is uh, actually living in Colorado Springs now. And um, he and I corresponded about several of the things that we'll, we'll talk about tonight. But it's fitting to dedicate this sort of to Tom Stephen. Um, he really was the guy that, that put it together in the field. And this is a map of the San Juan volcanic field. And the blue is the outline of the field. And that is the Creed caldera. And these are the nested calderas that are all a part of what is called the central caldera complex. And this is Lake City and Silverton. Uh, this was actually understood by Burbank and Lewitke back in the, in the 30s. But it was this part that people really hadn't caught on to until Tom started mapping it. And then, of course, it's been greatly refined. refined. Peter Lippmann has uh, put together this now, and this is, I guess, the latest of all of the maps that have come out. But the main feature that's on here that's striking is the big outline. And that's one of the largest uh, volcanic structures on the face of the Earth outside of things like the mid-ocean ridges. And that's the Lagarita Caldera. And it was the first that erupted. Um, in the old estimates, they said it was greater than 3,000 cubic kilometers uh, of eruptive material, I think now they've got it up to something like 5,500 and the boundaries have changed through the years. There's a whole series of maps comparing one to the other to the other to the other. But the point is that Creed is sitting right in the middle of it. Now the town's actually up here and the Creed Caldera is the latest one and it is overlapping the next to the oldest which is the Bachelor. So, how do these calderas form and what on earth do I mean when I'm talking about a caldera? This is a plain old stratovolcano and it's got a main central vent and this is the magma chamber underneath it and it is venting to the surface in various places and when it actually starts to erupt, that magma chamber starts to empty. empty. 
And that's the key to the process because the weight of the overburden can't be supported by that empty chamber underground. And as a result, you get a collapse and the collapse all occurs along faults. Each one of those vertical lines is a fault. And this is all moved down as a series of blocks. And when that happens, it's like a pump and it pumps all this pressured material up and that pours out in the form of new AR dot eruptions. And those new AR dot just means glowing cloud. And some people call them ignimbrites and at various times in the past, the one's been favored over another. But new AR dot will do. And the governing feature is how big's the magma chamber? How big is that subsurface body of molten material under here? And how much can collapse when you start the eruption? And when it's over, you're going to end up with a feature that is bowl-shaped. We call it a caldera. And there are all these fault blocks that have subsided and sedimentation can go on and there are steam vents and ducts and things like that that go on for a long period of time. You can go back to the um, I think it's the 1920s, maybe a little bit earlier. And um, the National Geographic is running all over Alaska talking about the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. And that's what that is, is the, the steam vents from a major eruption that occurred up there. And sedimentation continu can continue to occur and actually it can get to the point where there's even a lake involved. And then you can get magma that comes back into that magma chamber and you cause a resurgence and you can push some of this material back up and that's reasonably common. That was first worked out at the Valles Caldera um, in northern New Mexico in the mid 30s and 40s. But, and you've all seen the Valles Caldera if you've ever watched the show Longmire. It's supposed to be filmed in Arizona, but his house sits right there on the bottom floor of the caldera, and you're looking out toward resurgent mountains in the distance, and there's beautiful shots. It's, it's actually one of these things. That it's, it's worth it to check out the movie just to see that, and then you can turn it off, whether you like the story or not. So, Frank Perret took some photographs while he was down there of Montpellier erupting. And this is the start of a new Ardant eruption that is coming down. You can't see the summit of Montpellier. And this thing is coming downhill. And that's 30 seconds later. And that's 30 seconds later. And what we're talking about is something that from the front and this is something pretty mild. This is from Mount Pinatubo several years, uh, probably a generation ago now, in the Philippines, and it's coming at you. And this isn't a mere pimple, but it is a burp because you can actually see sky up there. But you don't want to be in that SUV. And if you were to look at it in a diagram, this is the central conduit and the rim of a volcanic crater. And this is an ash particle flow. And that's what new AR dot actually is referring to. We call it a glowing cloud, but it's gl a glowing cloud of gas and particles. And ash doesn't have anything with burning. There's, there's nothing to do with, with the act of burning. Rocks don't burn. Ash is a particle size term. And you can say that it's basically on the size of sand grains. And sand grains can be really, really fine material. And it can be smaller than sand grains. It's a, it's a broader classification. But the point is, is that this cloud of particles and gas is rolling downhill at some place between 100 and 200 miles an hour. Faster than a freight train. 
and you've got this huge cloud that is dust and heat and gases that's con con convecting above it but this this thing is something not to behold it is something to avoid at all costs and the reason that it's happening is primarily one involved with, with the viscosity of the magma. Those pictures I showed you at first that were of basaltic magmas have relatively low viscosities as far as molten rocks go. And they will flow. And in fact, the survey was releasing numbers, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago saying, yeah, you know, it's covering hundreds of yards per hour. And that's from the flow of this material. And you, you look at some of the films that they have in Hawaii, and some of it certainly seems to me to be flowing faster than that. But the point is, it's not, any, it's not even close to anything like a 100 to 200 mile an hour flow. And that's because this stuff is so viscous that it won't flow. And in fact, just as sort of an aside, if you take a crucible and stick a felspar crystal in it, and felspar is one of the major constituents in these magmas, and put it in a furnace and melt it, and you get it up to melting temperature and let it sit there, and you pull it out and you look down in there and it looks exactly the same. So if you look down into that crucible, the felspar crystal is going to look like it's a crystal sitting down at the bottom of it. And if you take some tongs and turn it over, it will in fact flop out and it'll sort of deform because it is in fact molten and it'll set fire to your bench. But after you quit worrying about that, then you, you get the point that this is something that doesn't, it's not like running water, it's not like running maple syrup, it's not like anything like that. The closest analogy, I guess, would be something like Silly Putty. If you put it on the floor overnight, then it'll run all over the place in a small area and set fire to your carpet and your wife will kick you out of the house for doing this kind of stuff. But the point is, it doesn't run. And furthermore, it doesn't allow the gases to move very well through it. So the eruption is an explosion because when you start releasing the pressure, the gases are expanding and the whole thing explodes and all the little particles head downhill. And not only do they move with the speed of a freight train, they move with the force of a freight train. And this is a picture that Perret took of a typical not just a single, but a typical lava boulder that was transported by the new AR dot for five kilometers. And the San Juans are a complex of these kinds of calderas, each and every one keyed to this kind of eruption in the, in the central area. You, the volcanic history of the area starts at around 35 to 31 million years ago and the first thing that that happens is the eruption of the Lagarita caldera, the biggest one, and that gives us the rock that we call Fish Canyon Tuff, and Tuff just means that it's a rock composed of volcanic particles. It's not lava, it's particles that have all solidified together. And this one is showing greater than 3,000 uh, cubic kilometers. Now we would have it actually a lot higher than that, but it's occurring at 27 point whatever that is, six or eight, I can't really read it at this angle, um, years ago. And the next one is the Carpenter Ridge Tuff that's a part of the Bachelor Caldera erupting, and that's a smaller caldera inside the big one. And as it turns out, there's some that we don't even really know where the eruptive center was. But, and we've just got unknown out here, but we go through all of these. And the very last one is the Creed Caldera. And then the district is mineralized. And 
it's this part right in here that is of extreme interest to us, but it all fits into this pattern of a large volcanic province that is contributing material in the subsurface that can be tapped and utilized by hydrothermal systems and deposit their mineral contents. So this is a map with the gray being the out present day outline of the San Juan volcanic field. And the sort of yellow ochre is the outcrop distribution of the Fish Canyon Tuff from the Lagarita Caldera. And the pile is between 30 and 200 meters thick for 15,000 square kilometers. That is a huge area. We're, we're talking about something that easily rivals and probably surpasses the Yellowstone Caldera. And I assure you that when it went off, it was a spectacular event depending on where you were standing. So, the rocks that have been derived from it, when you drive through the area around Crete, and in fact when you drive over the pass into Lake City and all through the San Juans, oftentimes seem to be in these stacked layers. And as it turns out, that is one unit from one caldera, that is one unit, that is one unit, that is one unit, and that is one unit. And each one of those represents a major eruption in this series of nested calderas that are a part of this central San Juan complex. And theoretically, it's been proposed that there was a very large batholith deep in the subsurface that was feeding smaller stratovolcanoes beginning around 35 million years ago. And then with time, that continued to rise. And as the batholith approached the surface, then major volcanism broke out. There actually aren't a whole lot of those stratovolcanoes that are, that are left. Most of them were completely consumed in the caldera forming process. But this is the kind of thing on the regional scale that is responsible for uh, ultimately the mineralization of the Creed um, ore deposits. And if we actually look at a map of the Creed caldera here and the Bachelor caldera here and the San Luis complex which now is mapped as several different calderas they're all lying inside the big Lagarita, and every one of these during collapsed had this central system of faults that is the mechanism of the actual collapse. And at Crete, and in fact it also happened uh, in the Crete caldera, there is mineralization that has occupied those systems of faults. And they are long, continuous faults that is a perfect site for mineralization events. And if you look at it in cross-section, you can see the system that we talked about last time, the amethyst vein system, and the P vein, and the OH vein, and then over here, the Bulldog Mountain Fault. And just to orient you, this Solomon Holy Moses fault is the one where the original discoveries by Nicholas Creed were made. And the one over here on the Alpha Corsair is where the earlier discoveries were made of the Alpha mine uh, that never really amounted to much of, of anything. And if you look at it in cross section, um, that shows this central area that has subsided, collapsed, been downthrown, however you want to phrase it, when that magma chamber emptied below. 
and this is the amethyst fault and that's the OH vein and OH fault and this is the Bulldog Mountain fault and one of the things that Tom Stephen discovered and he and along with Jim Rattay and some other people did some work in the early and mid 60s and they decided that you know the, the key to, to, to mining in the Crete area seems to be tied to is this thing connected to the amethyst vein system and if the answer is yes then the chances are that it's really economic if no then it's real iffy and because of that thought coming up the survey actually contacted a couple of mining companies and said you know you want to you want to drill some holes and figure out some things and as it turns out Homestake you know, from Leeds, South Dakota, the big gold mining operation took them up on the, on the prospect and they ended up discovering mineralization in the Bulldog Mountain um, fault system and that turned into a mine that operated from 66 to I think it was 88. Now there's one more kicker that's in all of this. This, this is Crater Lake. But the Creed Caldera had a lake in it, a whole lot like this. Essentially, the Paleo Rio Grande River was sort of dammed up. And this becomes a feature in the geology of that area. And this is actually not, uh, that's. Devil's Island, Dragon's Island, something like that in the middle of Crater Lake. It's not true resurgence, it's a small vent. But the Creed Caldera actually has major uh, resurgence. And if you look, I'm, I'm, in this view I'm standing on top of Bulldog Mountain and looking due south, and that is the floodplain of the Rio Grande River and actually the trees follow the river through it but it's also the location of ancient Lake Crete which is one of the features that Bethke and Barton and all of the guys studied for a number of years they drilled a couple of boreholes down into it and the information that they got is just almost unbelievable and Phil says they studied it to death and uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's the, one of the more wonderful things that the survey has done as far as western mining goes. But that area up here, that's actually Snowshoe Mountain, and with a good imagination it does sort of look like a snowshoe, and the, uh, the, the, that's a snow field that, that pretty much stays in place. And that's all of the resurgence in the area. And if you actually look at the area with emphasis on the creed, the ancient lake creed sediments, you can see things like a channel that actually goes up right next to and is bordered by uh, the upthrown block of the amethyst fault and all the way down into the area, the Rio Grande would be a little bit further to the south. And this is a bed of sedimentary rock that's you know, between 50 and three or 400 feet, maybe up to 500 feet thick, um, that was established in that area. And the sediments have something to do with the actual mineralizing fluids that uh, came to play in the uh, mineral, uh, mineralization of these fault systems. I, I used to look at this and think, well, I wonder if the lake ever spilled over in, into the vein, and Paul Barton assures me that that didn't happen, although he said he played with the idea too. Um, at any rate, there are deposits along the margins of that paleo channel that were actually mined in the early days because even though the lake was extraordinarily toxic, it's kind of like Lake Mono in California, um, it collected all kinds of debris. Leaves fell in it, entire trees fell in it. 
and some of that wood in the trees was mineralized. And this is a specimen in the museum, it's on display, of petrified wood, and it carries a very high silver content. It's actually ore. And there was a guy named Monkey Meyer uh, back in the 20s and 30s that for some reason decided that he would run an assay on this funky looking piece of wood that he found in his claim and ends up with a mine where he's mining silver mineralized petrified trees. Um, that's, that's not your typical ore, but nonetheless it's a great little chapter to the Creed story that fits right into the, the whole volcanic system and the hydrologic system. And if you look at the map that shows you basically the amethyst fault zone, we're talking about a major collapse feature in the downthrown area, there's a word for it, Grobin, of that bachelor caldera that has been mineralized. And that's a close-up of it. Right up here is the last chance in the amethyst mine. And those were two of the early discoveries on the amethyst vein system. Uh, the last chance was staked by a couple of prospectors and Nicholas Creed then staked the amethyst uh, using uh, David Moffat's money and uh, became a partner in the operation. And those were some of the earliest mines and they become a part of the series that we're going to get to here in just a second. This is a cross section that of the amethyst vein system and what it's basically showing you is the circulation of a lot of water. And some of the water is coming from the sediments of Lake Creed and some of it is probably meteoric water that is coming from over here and some of it is coming from the magma. And I'm not saying it was magma at that time, I'm just saying uh, uh, magmatic water in origin. And one of the things that has happened is that there is a cap of fairly impermeable clays that are right on top of the ore zone in the mines and those waters circulated in that area and as they mixed it lowered the temperature drastically and some of the studies show that uh, originally the waters were probably at something like 290 degrees C uh, maybe a little bit lower maybe 270 but when they mixed they were dropping way down and it was that mixing that actually causes the precipitation of these ores and so here is the amethyst lower on the hill and here is the last chance and the last chance in its upper workings had what they called a cave for want of a better term and that was loosely consolidated brecciated material in the fault zone that really wasn't stuck together very well. There had been enough movement and it had been broken up and it wasn't real stable. And to go in there and actually mine the thing would require an, an incredibly terrible job and very costly job of timbering. And so they came up with a unique mining method and it was to throw sticks of dynamite into it and they'd go off and then the stuff would come down and they would just pull it out on the ground. And the stuff that they were pulling out that was coming down the ground was this stuff. And this is what is called sow belly agate. And this is banded quartz that's purple that we call amethyst and banded quartz that has a micro crystalline texture that we call chalcedony. And the white basically is the chalcedony and the purple is the amethyst and in Paul Barton's studies, he has speculated with a high degree of certainty that this actually is opal that has altered to chalcedony 
through time. But the other part of it is this stuff. And this is a chalcedony nodule, and those dark streaks are leaf silver. And you can actually see it has this silvery look to it in this picture. And from here to here is about three inches across. And this is the stuff that they were mining. And the mining methods, not what you would call conventional, but it probably is the safest way that you could do something like that. And they did it for an entire level and into the next level. And the people that report on, some of the kids that grew up in the area used to stand up on the hill and watch the ore wagons. And they say that, you know, they came down the hill with these loads of purple crystals all over them. And every once in a while a piece would fall off. And it didn't matter whether it had silver or not. They were out there grabbing it and taking it home. But this is that material. And the way that it actually comes into existence is a part of this very long paragenetic sequence of events and it's not my purpose to try and go through this and, and get into true economic geology but it is happening in the second event and banded barite banded quartz sulfide minerals and sulfa salts and silver were all crystallized in that material throughout that time period. And furthermore, you can draw some conclusions by the kinds of crystals that you actually see. And there's one more point to all of this, and this, is, this was one of Phil Bethke's favorite things to say, and that is that the whole Creed deposit took less than 10,000 years to crystallize and form and in place. And that's a rather startling number. I remember in freshman geology, it became very obvious, and especially in the labs, where the lab instructor would say, and then millions of years passed and things happened. And that would be the explanation for all kinds of science. But that's real time. Those are crystals actually growing sort of like you grow them in the lab or something. And it's, since it's a big enough deposit, you know, it still takes a long time to do it. But we're talking less than 10,000 years. And this is based on the flow rate of material through the material that is furnishing the fluids and also on Paul's work with uh, the thermal dynamics of especially sphalerite and, and a couple of the vein systems. So this is a cross-sectional view of one very small part of the amethyst vein system and this is in uh, a, a paper that Paul wrote with Wayne Campbell that was published in Can Men. And the, the main thing to notice is that there are branches that are going off, and you also see these little white bubbles that are forming. And at certain times they are boiling, and at certain times they aren't boiling, but this is not a mechanism of ore deposition, apparently. And we also see a couple of things going on where chunks of rock have broken off, and they are forming breaches in place and they're sort of forming bridges and dams and we can also see that there are features that look like they are related to flows and we can see a series of cracks and down here we can see that there's an inflow of other material that is coming into the vein and in this one we see that the vein is part empty. And this isn't something that I think has been thought of very often or not thought of very often. It's just sort of passed over. But there are things in the amethyst vein system that we can see could only happen 
in an area that was dominated by vapor. I don't, I'm not saying you could go there, in there and stand there and breathe the stuff. Uh, the gases were probably really noxious and you'd keel over and you wouldn't want to get in the boat and try and float around in it. But the point is, it's a vapor dominated system at times. And that probably changes a number of times during its history. But the point is the water level has dropped and it's, we're still calling it boiling fluids. Sometimes maybe it is, sometimes maybe it isn't. And there are several things that we can talk about. We've got stalactites shown here. We've got draperies, like we see curtains and things like that in caves that we see up here. We've got more stalactites over here in this area that is uh, a giant pile of breccia that's lodged and blocking off part of it. We see dripping that has left stalactites. And basically with stalactites you're talking about two kinds of things that are happening. Uh, the first one is that it can simply be something that drips and the fluid comes down and you get crystallization on a micro scale and it continues to happen and it's always because there's a water envelope. And the water envelope is from the steam that is rising from the boiling waters and that then is reacting with the material on the wall taking that into solution and that becomes the material then that is forming these cave structures is what they amount to. And over here on this side we've actually got a typical stalactite forming uh, this one is a soda straw where it's just two walls in a cylinder and the water is just dripping down through it and in here where you've got a film of water on the outside but you've also got that central passage and the water is in fact dripping through it. There are some people that are real purists that say that's only the true stalactites and the other things are halectites or something like that and I, I don't want to go there. Um, but the point is that you've got several things that are going on like that. And a close-up view shows this one where you've got the dripping from just a water film and that's up here in an area that is dominated completely by vapors. Another thing that you've got though is a perched water table that's in a little low place and that is connected by a series of cracks down below. And we can see this in some of the rocks. Um, this is the amethyst chalcedony mixture that we call sal belly agate and I'll show you why in a second we call it that. And those are stalactites. And you can actually see if you look closely that there are several generations of different material. The chalcedony is the pure white and the sort of grayish to purplish is the amethyst and there are several generations that are being incorporated into it but those are stalactites. And on one of them there is a possibility of a central chamber that we can sort of see it depends on where you cut the thing and you don't know where you're cutting it when you're making the cut. In fact, you don't even know that that's in there. But nonetheless, this is the mechanism that we are seeing where this has been deposited probably in two parts through a central flow and also a flow um, from a water envelope around it. But there are also sulfide minerals that occur in this stuff and this is a stalactite of pyrite and it's got a bend in it basically a 90 degree bend but if you were to look at it right here under magnification there actually is a little open place and on the other end it's, it's held up by silicon putty for this view um, there's another opened end it is a tube all the way through and so iron sulfide was being dissolved someplace or maybe it was 
left over in that residual water table that was a perched water table. But pyrite is also crystallizing as stalactitic growths and so is phalerite. And on this one you can actually see that central hole right there. And furthermore, it is covered with more coarse crystals and obviously the cavities fill up again and the crystallization continued but in a different form with regular precipitation of crystals instead of uh, through the stalactitic type growths. And we see these kinds of things up here with plain dripping and we see them down here and we see them in here and we also see this perched reservoir with a residual brine and that may be the key to some of the sulfide mineralization that actually shows up in these places. And some of them obviously were dripping and there are some very delicate structures none of which really are uh, suitably photographed that we see in places like this but they're actually showing a flow direction of currents uh, into and through the vein system and there are also places where there are little hummocks that seem to be from the inflow of a, of a second fluid. This is a series of stalactites. They're galena. And one of the wonderful things back in the old days, I would have tried to turn this thing upside down and then stack everything the right way so that I could photograph it. And now it's real simple. You just turn the slide over. But at any rate, each one of those elongated features is a stalactite and then it is covered with surface crystals and those all came from the crystallization and then proceeded directly from the hydrothermal fluids filling the vein again. And the reason for the sow belly name to the agate is this. The miners said it looked like bacon and they bought cheap sow belly to mix with their beans and that's what they lived on and so when they found the stuff their imagination had no no problem conjuring up uh, that term. If you look at it in cross section you can see that oftentimes there are a series of layers on either side of a central area there actually is a cavity running through a lot of this and this corresponds to this, this with this, all the way through. And so this is growth, not from that central part out, but from the walls in. And corresponds essentially to the filling of the vein with this material. And you see the little um, blebs, dark colored things, all the way through it. And those are all sulfide minerals. And in a lot of cases, in this particular area, uh, that is actually silver mineralization. And this is a specimen of the, of the museums, and that's about a foot by a foot. Uh, really a very fine example of uh, the sow belly type growth. And this is simply a vug of amethyst where that particular stage had a lot of amethyst growth in the hydrothermal solutions in a area that remained somewhat open and so you don't have complete filling of the vein. And if you look at then a map just showing you the veins, the, again this is the amethyst and that's the bulldog. The bulldog was mined in the 60s by miners who were very conscious of the value of the silver ores and they for the most part were collectors. They may not have started out being collectors but they were collectors before it was over and there was a huge underground and I don't mean underground in the mine, an underground market in the Creed area 
with guys that were filling up their lunch buckets with all kinds of stuff and bringing it back. And because of that, we have material in the museum and we have material in private collections all over the country. And it's really one of our best examples of what did Bonanza silver ores look like because the spectacular mining of the vein material of the amethyst vein system was in the 30s and 40s and 50s and those were base metal sulfides. And so these Bonanza ores are over here on the Bulldog Mountain faults and that's the Bulldog Mine. It was never really officially named, but named the Bulldog Mine. It was Home Stakes Bulldog Mountain Project, and it just got Bulldog Mine stuck onto it, but they never really acknowledged it. And this is a cross-sectional view of the Bulldog Vein A. And the interesting part of it is in this area right under the surface and the really dark portions and this map was actually I mean this cross-section was put together during an environmental study when people were concerned about the acid mine drainage and thing and, and that's what it's actually showing that it's very high here but the actual mineral content was botryoidal pyrite a lot of which really started out life as marcasite and sulfa salts and sphalerite and galena. And if you look at the specimens, you also begin to notice that they are very much alike from different areas of the vein if the miner that collected them actually wrote down the stope or the level or anything like that. And a lot of those guys did. And this is a diagram that's in Paul Barton's paper with Phil Bethke and Ed Roeder that was done back in economic geology in 1977. I just added the colored arrows and made it a little bit fancier. But the point is that what you're really talking about in most of these textures is the saturation of the hydrothermal waters with particular constituents. And what especially Paul discovered, the higher that saturation went, different kinds of crystallization habits would, would actually be expressed in it. And this shows up all the way through Crete, and one of the reasons it shows up is because of these big circulating cells, the saturation levels change from one level of the mine to the other. And in that previous cross-section, we saw gel, we, we saw the product that would give you gel precipitates, which is the botryoidal. And what that's telling you is that in that area, we're going to have gel precipitates because it almost gets gooey because it's so saturated. It's not, it, it, and the reason it's like that is because it's, it's coming out of solution so fast it doesn't have time to form good crystals. And that's basically what's happening. You could also call this time going down here with greater time. And these are things that are happening fast because of that supersaturation. And that shows up in the minerals. Those are perargerite crystals. Um, they're about an inch long. And that's silver sulfa salt. Perargerite is the antimony rich form. And this is pyrite that it's lying around in. And this stuff was never oxidized in, in place because of that cap that was above it that helped with, with the concentration of the solutions. And if you look at the py pyrargyrite crystals, they're rough. And that's because they're partially skeletal. And if you go back up here, the skeletal crystals, as it turns out, are still up in the supersaturated 
area well above down here where we grow great fantastic crystals in labs and things like that and, and lots of ore deposits too but that habit is showing up and this just happens to be a rare silver sulfa salt that is showing the thing that that particular habit but you can see it in the galena this is a skeletal galena crystal and the view across from there is about two and a half inches and this hasn't been filled all the way in this is an octahedral face and that's an octahedral face and that's an octahedral face so you're looking at the join there between three faces of an octahedron and it's that the crystallization was so fast it couldn't fill in therefore you get this skeletal habit and this shows up all the way through creed and if you go back then again on that diagram when you get down here at the bottom where you are below the equilibrium saturation you start removing things and you can actually totally remove things and you see that in creed too and it shows up in all these textures Sometimes I wish I could put together an exhibit that actually showed all of this stuff, but it would probably not be a popular one, and people on campus would go, what on earth are you trying to explain? These are ugly rocks, and you know, the spectacular ones are the better ones to show. But anyway, the point is you can see those textures. This is an argentite. Argentite isn't really a mineral. It's, it's the habit. They used to call it argentite. It's silver sulfide. The actual mineral, if you x-ray it now, is a canthite, but argentite was the original structure and almost all canthite actually started out as argentite. And that is a skeletal crystal. That's what, what all of these little re-entrant cavities and things are, is places where the crystal didn't have a chance to completely grow. And from top to bottom, that's about an inch. And that, that's a reasonably respectable example of primary silver sulfide. The banded ore that it's talking about, some of this stuff is occurring as um, almost colloidal type solutions and this is the bulldog mine equivalent to the sow belly. But in the bulldog mine a lot of times it was barite that grew in this banded form with various sulfides. That's galena, that white is probably some quartz, but all of that white and all of this white is barite. That dark black is probably all argentite, acanthite, and this is silver, pure native silver. So this is extraordinarily rich ore, and the banded ore in both vein systems was very important economically throughout the mining history. These are silver crystals. From top to bottom, that's probably an inch and a half, something like that, but that's a spear of arborescent growth, uh, branching growth um, of native silver. And this is out of that zone that is shown in that uh, cross-section. And this is also crystal and silver, but it's sort of, in some ways you look at it and you say that's sort of turning into wire growth. And it may be a part of some of the secondary enrichment process, and it may not be. Um, it's sort of one of these problematic specimens that you look at and eventually say, well, six one way, half a dozen the other. But you can definitely see some arborescent type growth, but then you see some of these other things that look like wires. And because wires are important in Creed, there is that possibility of the change. And this is leaf silver. This is the stuff that was growing inside the chalcedony in that specimen from the uh, last chance mine. And from here to here is about six inches. And that's two inches wide, um, probably about a millimeter thick at its thickest place. And you, you, have, you can't just pick it up. It's, it's actually very fragile. Um, most of these things have not survived very well through the years. And this is the silver that everybody has always been enchanted with at, silver, at, at Creed 
uh, it is wire silver and it is actually growing out of that argentite acanthite. There is an alteration and furthermore this stuff then alters back to acanthite. Um, when Tom Stephen was in his last years he said he opened up one of his major boxes of silver that he had collected through the years and he said there's no silver wire in there it's all now black dust it all went back to acanthite to silver sulfides. So last slide. Last time I showed you this and showed that approaching 60 million ounces of silver were mined between 1891 and 1996. And between 1969 and 1985, there was another 25 million ounces that uh, were returned almost completely from the Bulldog Mine. There were, there were a couple of small little things, but no more than maybe 100,000 ounces from any place else. And it really is one of the best records of what Bonanza silver deposits of the frontier west actually look like. Uh, and we have a reasonably good uh, story to put together, largely because of Tom Stephen all the way through Bethke and Barton and up to Peter Lippman now and all the work he has done with the volcanics. Um, and we can fit it into a total picture. But that's the Creed story. Thank you all very much.